Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, and welcome back to Concordia University's Fourth Space for the next final event for us here, Undermining Urban Gardens. Last event of Fourth Space is part of the Hope and Agency in Uncertain Times Conference. Now, to help situate you, we're streaming to YouTube live from Fourth Space. We are located at unceded Indigenous lands in Chichage, Montreal. And here at Four Space, we work with our university community to help mobilize knowledge by co-creating daily activities, research questions, projects, things in development across the university. For those of you joining us on Zoom, we are running this as a live stream Zoom meeting. So please plop any questions or comments you have into the chat. And those of you joining us here in the space, just raise your hand and we'll get a microphone over to you for questions. With that, it's my pleasure to hand it over to the principal of Loyola College for Diversity and Sustainability, Jim Grant. Jim. Thank you, Doug. Uh, thanks, Doug. Thanks to uh, Bertie, uh, Jax, uh, Issa, and all the Fourth Space crew for collaborating with us. This is such a great uh, conference with your help. So welcome to the final event of our third day of our four-day conference. We meet next at Loyola all day in person. So join us there and Rebecca will tell us more about that later. Um, thank you also for that territorial acknowledgement. Um, much of our work is about place and so uh, and much of our work is here in Jujage. So thank you for that. Um, for those online, if you're not coming from Montreal, maybe you could uh, take this time to check out uh, the land on, uh, where you're coming from. Rebecca, we'll pop something into the chat that might help you if you're interested in doing that. So, okay. Well, today, uh, it's a treat to in introduce Dr. Mitch McLernan. Um, Mitch is an assistant professor in Department of Education and is a brand new member of the Loyola Sustainability Research Center. So we invite our new members to give a keynote in our annual conference so the community gets to know him really well. Uh, so we're, we're pleased he's here. Um, his current research, he does a lot of things. Uh, his current research focuses on environmental and climate education, community development, gentrification, food security, institutional ethnography, urban political ecology, and participatory visual methods. But today is going to tell us about urban gardens. So Mitch, we're pleased you're here and take it away, please. Well, well thank you very much, Jim. And, and um, yeah, so it's really great to be here. Um, as Jim mentioned, my name is Mitch. Please call me Mitch. Um, before getting into the talk, I want to start with a few acknowledgements myself. Um, first, I want to acknowledge as well that that my talk today is taking place on the unceded territories of the Gunagahage. And I want to acknowledge my solidarity and overall support of Indigenous sovereignty. And in spirit of that solidarity, I recognize the urgency of stopping resource extraction projects that threaten the lives of future generations. Um, and since land has been a key area of my analysis in relation to my community-based research on gardening and urban agriculture here in Jojage, Montreal, which we'll get into in a few moments, I want to acknowledge, you know, this solidarity and support, et cetera. I also want to acknowledge all of you. Thank you so much for coming. Jim, thank you. Rebecca, thank you. Bertie Doug, Fourth Space, thank you. And um, academic labor is really interrelated, and I see it as such. And labor is another area of analysis that I want to talk to uh, talk to you about in relation to gardens. So, yeah. Um, okay. So, thanks so much for being here. And here's what today is going to look like. Uh, this format is kind of like a talk at you. But true to popular education, which is a practice that I employ in my pedagogy, I'd also like to meet you where you are, you know, kind of in this embodied adult education sense. And I'm a professor of adult education. So there, there are going to be a few moments in this talk where I'm going to ask you some questions and I'm going to take a pretty awkward pedagogical pause. All right. Don't feel like you need to, uh, to answer, but... Um, when I do ask a question or try to interact with you, please know that there's no need to reply, but feel free to reflect and I'll just move on with the talk soon after. 
So a lot of today's talk will encircle gardening for social and environmental justice. And I want to note that my research and community-based engagement is all about relationships. <laughs> for more than a decade, I've been working with many people from across Montreal and in a myriad of different contexts, schools, universities, community-based organizations, in, in local neighborhoods. And with my community partners, I'm going to do my best not to name so many of them because um, we're currently conducting research. And of course, there's ethics involved in that. Um, but the kind of research that I do is always commensurate with the kind of scholar I seek to be. And in working in the community sector, we as scholars have a duty to do no harm. Or as I say, in a visual research sense, and I'll explain this more later, we have a duty to do more good than harm. And I foreground my research and community work with the question, is it ethical? So I want everyone to know that there's not going to be a lot of text in my slides. Every image and artistic creation that's presented today has been produced by myself or one of the project participants. There was a song that was in here. I took it out. Jim, I wasn't even kidding. There, there was a song in this presentation. We can talk about that later. So. In today's talk, I'm going to be subscribing to some synergies that I theorize in my research, and we'll be returning to my theoretical and methodological influences that inform how I come to this moment with all of you today. So I work a lot in, um, in an academic sense with people like W.E.B. Du, du Bois, Bell Hooks, Dorothy Smith, Hamani Banerjee, who underscore that the capacity for collective action is not located in discourse, institutional processes, government policies, but rather it's among people. In fact, the title of my talk, Undermining Gardens, is a shout out to Dorothy Smith. Undermining is about finding problematic categories and mining underneath them. So I wanna just give you a quick overview of what I do and what I've been doing, all right? Um, with several different local partners and for the past several years, uh, we have independently secured ongoing funding to create and support multiple different school and community gardening initiatives. And we have called ourselves the garden team, right? Um, so since 2016, the garden team and I have focused on supporting schools and community-based organizations in Montreal in the development of equitable environmental education whatever that means, while locating our works work in the actual material sites where education and community learning takes place, specifically on university campuses, at local schools, in several different community-based organizations, adult ed centers, local neighborhoods and green spaces, and so on. So using ethnographic, textual, and visual methods while drawing on several converging and at times overlapping theorists and theories my unique inquiries makes visible the social and environmental relations that connect my embodied experience and the experience of others to the discursive economic policy organization of gardening and education in different contexts. My research prerogative is to report on the unseen and underexamined social and ecological relations of community gardens and to dissect the role of discourses encircling the employment of urban agriculture in relation to adult and environmental education in different areas of the city. So my research starts with people's embodied experience of an issue and explores environmental education for social and environmental justice uh, specifically, I look at the intersecting uh, impacts of policy in a historical materialist way, which is like a fancy Marxist way of saying that our past is materially connected to what we are experiencing today. So before describing this work and how I came to it and its background and some of my more compelling research findings on gardens, I want to restate that my work is really all about relationships. And I wanna to open today with a relationship that I've been quite negligent with, a relationship um, that I continue to grapple with and, and that's my relationship to the planet. So a few years ago, as this project was taking shape, I was working in one of the gardens that I had created for food production purposes with a local community organization that serves about 80,000 meals per year to people experiencing homelessness and food insecurity. Anyway, I was doing some gardening and I don't know about you, but I don't like to wear gloves when I'm gardening. 
And this has nothing to do with the purported benefits of actually touching the soil. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, it's more to do with me literally and figuratively feeling connected to place. When I finished harvesting some of the radishes, look at those French breakfasts, um, for one of my community partners, I went inside to wash up before biking home uh, because it was the evening, all the lights were off in this building. Um, and the building that we're viewing, I'll just go back to it, it's just on the right over here, like laser pointer, there it is. It's called Coach House. Um, as I entered and I went to flick on the lights, I, uh, I quickly stopped myself. I thought to myself, well, this is my office and I know this building incredibly well. And we all know that turning on the lights uses electricity and you know, not wanting to use the electricity or be wasteful and quite pleased with myself for, for being sustainable and environmental. I walked to the sink basin to wash up because I had dirty hands, right? And I went to turn on the hot water tap uh, before whispering to myself, don't, Mitchie, don't even think about touching the hot water tap without putting some soap on your hands. And why use hot water when you can use cold water, right? Because cold water is just as good and uses fewer resources. So finally, I got to washing my hands, trying to get the dirt from underneath my fingernails and also scrubbing for over 20 seconds. I rinsed off my hands and reached for a piece of paper towel, but then I pulled my hand away once again, feeling that I was being wasteful, but it was too late. I had ripped a small corner of the paper towel and it fell to the ground. And, you know, not wanting to leave litter because, you know, littering's bad and it's not environmental. I got down on my hands and knees in the dark and started patting the ground, looking for the piece of paper towel, right? <laughs> yeah, so after touching the ground a few times, I realized that I'd come full circle. And as I was down on the ground, I thought to myself, there's got to be a better way, a more hopeful and agentic way of thinking through what I describe as this sustainability problem. So in my case, I was so focused on counting my environmental behaviors that I was losing touch with my relationship. And I had worked myself into this place of eco paralysis that wasn't doing me any good. And I began asking myself a lot of questions. Why am I doing all this? Why do I bike everywhere in the city? Why do I garden? Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to provide the questions to the following answers. It's gonna, gonna be a little bit like Jeopardy, right? Okay. So just to be clear, I'm not asking anyone in the audience today to respond to any of these Jeopardy style questions I'm about to present, but feel free to think about it. And I'll employ a 15 second pause here. I know some of you probably know the questions I'm looking for. So here's the first answer. Four minutes. So the question that, that I'm looking for is how long humans would survive without clean air? Four days how long humans would survive without clean water. Um, for four weeks, food, right? We depend on food. We would depend on the sun and the earth's resources, photosynthesis, photo light, synthesis growth. You all know this. And um, this last one, oh, I skipped four weeks. Sorry about that, friends. In four years. Then the question I'm looking for here is, you know, pollinators, right? Many of our food systems would collapse within four years without pollinators. So we're dependent, human beings, and of course the non-human world as well, we're dependent on clean air, clean water, and the Earth's biodiversity for human survival. And as such, I felt like I needed to reflect on my relationship with the planet that sustains me and find meaningful ways to reciprocate this relationship. So why garden? Well, as I'm sure some of you know, Community and educational gardening for multiple purposes is particularly well-developed in literature. And I call these narratives scholarly tropes. So I'll just go through some of them. Gardens promote ecological community and nutritional literacies and an understanding of food sourcing, where our food comes from. Gardens and, and gardening provide engaging experiential learning opportunities for community learners. 
Through gardening, learners can connect with nature and begin to understand human dependence on the natural world, leading to environmental stewardship. We hear this all the time. We just need to spend more time outside. We'll learn to love it. We'll learn to connect with nature and um, we'll start to take care of our planet. Exposure to nature through gardens has a myriad of health and well-being benefits. And here are some other ones. Gardens address food security. Gardening develops patience. I've been gardening for over 15 years and I am like the most impatient person ever. Uh, so anyways, uh, gardening is a great exercise and is a groovy recreational activity. Through gardening, community is developed and many, many more. So what I find problematic about these narratives is that they are presented and reproduced through discourse as beneficial to all. As I write, gardens in Montreal, Chiojage, do not exist in a snow globe. They exist under rampant global capitalism, under the legislation of a settler colonial nation state. While I believe in the immense potential of gardens and participate in strengthening these narratives that I present in my research, <laughs> um, encircling sustainability, food security, educational and well-being outcomes while benefiting from this type of celebratory garden discourse through funding schemes and institutional partnerships. Rather than simply report on the positive benefits of gardens, greening, and urban agriculture, my research embraces the complexities that emerge from gardens while complicating these dominant and limited narratives as magical or as inherently good for all. And I like to complicate them within critical discussions related to the history and politics of land, settler colonialism, neoliberal funding schemes, labor, and gentrification. In my writing and ongoing community-based research, I respond to policy and governance issues related to sustainability, healthcare, safety, transportation, education, and land use. So I just wanna show you a couple of shots of, you know, some, some new greening initiatives in Montreal. I'm not sure if anyone's walked by Guy and St. Antoine recently, but here's a, a new biodiversity zone in the city. And you can tell that it's biodiverse because the sign's there. Have a look, there it is. Yeah, I just want to just point out the new biodiversity zone. There it is, same zone. There's another one. <clears throat> oh. That's not a biodiversity zone, but that was cut back a few days after I took that photo. And here's here's the, the closest Ruelle Verte to Concordia, these green alleys. I just want to point out this green alley, right? I'll use the laser pointer. You can tell it's a green alley because it says it right there. Okay, okay, all right. So in response to the overwhelmingly positive and often unquestioned discourse encircling educational and community gardens, I complicate my gardening work with what Foucault calls hyperactive pessimism. Here, his argument is that not everything is bad, but that everything is dangerous. And if everything is dangerous, then we, as hyperactive pessimists, always have work to do. Foucault states that his position is not one of apathy, but rather of a hyper and pessimistic activism, and to encourage us to encounter the ethical political choice we have to make every day to determine which is the main danger. Throughout my work, I don't claim that gardens are inherently bad or not useful for social, environmental, and educational reasons. On the contrary, I, I believe in many things that are written about gardens. I think gardens have immense potential for addressing social and environmental ills and for enabling meaningful, authentic educational opportunities, especially in a city. I do, however, argue that the employment design and overall use of gardens, especially in cities, has never been neutral, have been rooted in the relations of capital, accumulation, dispossession, and as such, can produce different outcomes along racial, ethnic, class, gender, and in Montreal, linguistic lines where their social and environmental justice potential is unfortunately not realized. In these relations where gardens can be more hype and harm than help, there are dangers to acknowledge, and I continue to question if my own work is actually helping improve social, educational, and environmental injustices and not exacerbating them. 
However, I want to I want to quibble a little bit with Foucault's idea and and um, and with my own approach. I, I like to kind of embrace this idea of hyperactive optimism as a researcher and and you know community engaged scholar for social educational and environmental justice, it's imperative not to enter the space of paralysis that I described a moment ago, or entropy where individuals and communities are unable to move from frustrations, and I, I'm very frustrated, to collective action and inter-individual accountability. In efforts to do more good than harm, this orientation of optimism allows me to understand and relay that there are more than environmental, social, educational justice successes and failure, failures, and to never stop trying. Okay. So I'm going to contextualize the project background within my findings. I may touch a little bit on methodology and theories in, in a bit, and if you ever have questions, I promise to leave some time. So I'm going to start with gardening on a, on a university campus, and this, this isn't Concordia. This is another... Uh, institution in Montreal that's also English speaking. Okay, so soon after uh, starting my doctoral work at McGill, I began to find ways to draw educational connections to the community-based work I was doing. Uh, about nine years ago, I began applying for grant funding to support some of my ideas related to working with uh, youth and adults. And soon after, I was awarded my first garden grant, and I used the funds to expand McGill's education garden. I was installing these beds for food production and other social and environmental purposes. This is a three sisters garden that was created with a, a local knowledge holder. It's no longer there, unfortunately. Um, some of these changes on campus, like digging random holes, was met with a lot of resistance from other faculties at McGill. And this resistance certainly points to how land is always contested and often influenced by different institutional and competing interests and forms of development. And trust me, we'll get into this a little bit later. Over the next few months, I began to apply for funding as many people expressed interest in this kind of community engaged gardening that I was attempting to develop and grapple with and can just continuously failed at. Um, I received two additional grants and continued to develop my educational connections and pedagogical framing in relation to gardens within community-based organizations. Um, at this time, I was simultaneously working in the community sector and was facilitating a participatory research collaboration with young adults from a local hip-hop studio. For the purpose of this presentation, we'll call it Champion Sound. It, anyways, it's in Cote d'Ange. It's amazing. Check it out. The main focus of our collaboration was on the institutional processes, social determinants of health and education that shape exclusionary and disproportionate developmental trajectories for youth and adults in different locations of Montreal. Um, under the umbrella of this project was where I first designed and facilitated an installation of a community-based garden. Before I move on, there are two stopping points here. In many ways, this participatory project at Champion Sound acted as a prototype for my future gardening work and my future community-based visual research. This garden was indeed led and was also more, it was like, you know, led by the youth hip hop group with whom we were partnering. And it was also more beautiful and productive than my own garden. So I was a bit jealous, but that's okay. Um, secondly, I want to state what I found most compelling about our work here was not that we were like greening this concrete space or like seeing this as a political act of greening, but rather that the artists with whom we were working began to use this garden in their artistic and creative processes and in their music. They mentioned that before this garden, they never used the studio's outdoor space. This seemingly small realization of a garden producing something other than the scholarly tropes that I described earlier, or this rhetoric of effects where we have ideas about what we want gardens to do and produce, was a really important one for me. What if gardens could be used expansively and as an entry point? And here's what I mean by this. 
Organizations and educational centers, schools, teachers, community workers, workers often need a garden. But how can we as community-based researchers respond to more pressing needs of our communities? So in using gardens, garden funding, and paid garden labor, we use gardens as an entry point. Okay. So this entry point required a different kind of ethical commitment. We garden for social, educational, and environmental purposes, but in using gardens expansively as this entry point to partnerships and relationships, we work to address the material needs of people and organizations with whom we partner. So we also supported meal teams, right? So we're working with different community-based organizations, working with people experiencing homelessness, food insecurity, barriers to education and employment, right? So yeah, we would do things like support meal teams, fundraise, deliver food baskets, pick up food at, at local food banks, create websites, event planning, and importantly, design educational projects and mentorships in the community sector. Like, CV workshops, literacy workshops, gaming, like video games. I don't play video games, so just I need that extra descriptor. And this is because we worked in a non-hierarchical way. And I encourage the garden team to bring themselves and their interests into our group meetings and to make meaningful contributions. And they're supported to get something out of it, true to popular education. So one team member wrote a song, but you know, we also tried to provide other opportunities for different people working on this pro project to publish their writing in a journal or display their art there. And with this, and in conversation with the garden team and community partners, this is where we went next. The overall shape and direction of the project shifted in the spring of 2018 when we started working with some funding from Employment and Social Development Canada. And the, the project title at that point was Gardening for Food Security. All right. The hope here was to draw social, environmental and educational connections to the larger and emerging garden work at a university campus and, and with the university while expanding and supporting the gardens and relationships within local community organizations. Importantly, in writing the grant, I aligned the grants narratives with not only the tropes that I displayed earlier, but also with the federal government's local priorities. So in downtown Montreal, Ville-Marie, Le Sud-Ouest, there are many local priorities that reflect sustainability. Uh, they also reflect things like equity, diversity, and inclusion, right? I try to live these values, but there are some, some issues here. Um, I noticed that the hiring practices of the government came into direct conflict with people's lived experiences. For example, the grant funding is designed to support refugees and newly arrived Canadians, Canadians, but many of the people I tried to hook up with employment opportunities didn't actually have SIN numbers and then couldn't get hooked up with jobs. Like, so yeah, but I always, you know, keep finding ways to subvert stipulations that often claim neutrality, but produce and reproduce vastly disproportionate outcomes. Different funding schemes had different and specific stipulations for myself and others seeking to use the garden as employment, such as enrollment in educational institutions. For instance, in order to get youth and adults hooked up to gardens and garden employment, we devote a lot of time to meeting with people, booking meetings with admission advisors here at Concordia, actually. Uh, we enrolled garden team members as independent and mature students. We also connected team members with several adult education centers and developed relationships there. During this time, my community partners were also taking similar labor to get others connected to different garden employment programs. We tried to work as a team and act and react collectively. So without diving too deep into my analysis here, I found that while the funding and affiliation with universities helped me and my partners create garden teams and support community-based organizations, the administrative labor of getting youth and adults hooked up to both gardens and employability programs undercut the mentorship potential and overall objective of these different employability programs, which further undermines equity, diversity, and inclusion in objectives of the federal government. Here is what Sarah Ahmed calls audit culture, where the planning and auditing of equity, diversity, and inclusion becomes the action in itself that actually obscures the lack of equity, diversity, and inclusion. Yet, it enables the federal government to track their progress towards its outcomes or the local priorities that I mentioned earlier. 
which of course my more community-based vision did not support and actually vehemently oppose. So I'm kind of like showing you all the contradictions that I'm working with in my own work. And I wanna just say, I, this is a critique of my own garden projects. I'm not critiquing anyone else's work. I often get like five or six emails after I spend an hour critiquing gardens and everyone telling me that I'm wrong. I, I'm wrong, I'm not above correction. But I do wanna state that I'm critiquing my own work. I'm not critiquing anyone else's work. I'm, I'm here to learn from all of you as well. So in the community center, as I note, I work very closely with the day center. We'll call it the Griffin House that provides essential services for people experiencing homelessness. That spring, and each spring, we met with the program coordinator, the executive director, and the chef to determine what to plant in the garden and how to best proceed with work plans moving into the summer. As I sought to connect the act of food production to address some of the environmental injustices of capitalism. In other words, I wanted to center the concerns of people experiencing food insecurity in garden design and development. So in conversation with the chef, employees and guests of this organization, we completely redesigned the space and spent about two weeks supplementing the soil, digging trenches, moving around compost, installing paths to separate crops, to separate crops, coupling companion plants and flowers for pollination and pest resistance. And I got to know a lot of people who use the services here. Important to the gardening work at this organization was fostering an experience for those who spend time in the outdoor space. My reasoning for wanting gardens to be more than just a highly productive growing space, but also for gardens to be beautiful, sensual, and with an element of surprise, is because having access to spaces like this is also part of living a life of dignity. No one at this organization ever spoke about how tasty the kale or Swiss chard was, but everyone spoke about the experience of being in the garden and what that felt like. So contesting over-celebratory garden research, while the gardens and the garden team's work did modestly contribute to food security efforts in small but commendable ways, for example, we supplemented a daily meal service during the summer months and contributed to garden food boxes that were delivered to over 80 families. I, I really want to note that this was not enough food production for the organization to change or reduce their weekly order from the city's largest food bank called Moisson Marial. Yeah. So, in other words, while we, you know, the garden team and I were gardening prolifically with land, labor for food production purposes, what my research and community-based gardening efforts have revealed is that community gardening is not contributing to reducing food security concerns in any meaningful way for those who are actually encountering food insecurity. For instance, people with whom I work don't garden for their food security. They dumpster dive, which is now somewhat being criminalized in Montreal due to its 2030 zero waste policies, which by the way, they've changed because we live in a city, province and country that has never hit one environmental target. And again, this takes us back to the tropes. On the municipal side, the city of Montreal textually claims that gardens foster community development, inclusion, food security, and many environmental outcomes like increasing pollination and biodiversity and reducing urban heat islands, which is a process where urban and concrete areas absorb heat during the day and emit it at night. Um, many people in Montreal have died during recent heat waves. So this is a major issue. Greening has a role to play here. Uh, my ethnographic, textual, and policy data and analysis showed that city-mediated garden programs are designed and historically prioritized home-owning home individuals. To get hooked up, or historically to get hooked up to a community garden in Montreal, which by the way are fenced, locked, and gated, and look up the etymology of the word garden, it means enclosure. Um, you, you actually used to need to show Accès Montréal, the Accès Montréal office, a municipal tax bill, which many renters don't have. Of course, there are ways to subvert this. I certainly did. Uh, when, I, when I was looking for gardens for different organizations, I would show up and I would argue and I would say, hey, I need a garden. I, I'm, I'm now on four or five different wait lists and, and uh, 
there are 10 year wait lists for some gardens. I'm 47th on, on, on one of the, the gardens. Anyway, um, yeah. So, yeah, let me just, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my, my methodology here. I, I subscribe to, or the method of inquiry rather, I subscribe to the alternative sociology known as institutional ethnography. It's introduced by, by feminist sociologist Dorothy Smith, and it's intended to depart from conventional and historic approaches found in sociology. Dorothy Smith initially created institutional ethnography to democratize knowledge and create conditions for unity and empathy between communities and researchers. Despite this ethos, few scholars have managed to actualize these aims. In my work, I've used qualitative research to policy change processes to reveal and redress social, educational, and environmental policy relations that affect inequitable outcomes amongst people in Montreal. And I'm still in continuous conversations with garden partners, teachers, community organizations, and institutions, finding ways to develop and alter research outcomes, garden resources, and curriculum as appropriate. And so basically, um, an institutional ethnography interviews are like the starting point of my analysis. After I interview a bunch of people, that's when the research actually starts. I then go and trace their interview accounts into relevant texts and policies that produce those kinds of explanations. So to oversimplify here, institutional ethnography begins with people's embodied experience and seeks to reveal people's work practices that can be connected across time and space in like a Foucauldian governmentality sense by paying attention to the political, economic, and administrative systems that produce and shape diverging human experiences. I also use visual methods, as you can see. Um, and visual methods encourage researchers to make data collection and representation visible for more evocative readings, all right? So in this sense, my research seeks to make the unseen visible for more evocative readings related to how gardens work and what gardens are actually doing here in Montreal. And this is what I call keeping my eyes everywhere, right? Because a lot of these photos I take when I'm walking to work or when I'm on my bike, et cetera. And I really like that because it's exactly what I'm doing in this like visual embodied sociology sense. Even now, like I said, I'll be going for a walk and I take a shot. So I'm not the best walking companion these days, but here's an example of what I'm talking about. Check out some of these signs. This is what $245,000 of greening and transforming nature looks like. And here's another important thread of my project and of many institutional ethnographies, the reflexivity. I'm part of this problematic and, it, and have, in small ways, helped increase the value of land by investing in it through gardens. In our work, and this still troubles me, I have created gardens to fit in with the changing scenery of gentrifying neighborhoods. You've seen some of these in a couple of repeats here. So gentrification is a, is a pretty hot topic. It's a pretty complex topic, and sometimes it's a pretty slippery term to define. I want to discuss and contest, contest gentrification as this organic process started by entrepreneurial locals. Gentrification is a top-down social process whereby municipal, provincial, and federal governments pass laws and bylaws, allowing increased investment, usually in land. Typically, gentrification uh, can be predicted by exploring the local political economy. So in Montreal over the past decade, or several decades actually, neighborhoods have been changing because investing in the poorest or cheapest real estate will automatically yield the highest financial return for governments and private investors while concurrently increasing the city's residential tax base, which is its main form of revenue. During our early and community our community garden work with the Griffin House, a long-standing Montreal day shelter, as I mentioned, serving over 80,000 meals a year. They sold their building and property for a huge sum of money, but could not afford to buy anything else in the borough until this year. In fact, they're opening their, their new center on Atwater this year. Um, yeah, so super, super exciting. Anyway, they were forced to sell because of some of the developments that occurred in Griffintown that was facilitated by deindustrialization and the subsequent greening of the Lachine Canal. Gardening, greening, and labor cost a lot of money and further serves to increase the value of land. 
In these gentrifying neighborhoods, there is an increase of gardens, greening, and a range of other government-mediated services. Notice the new bus line in this picture. This wasn't here when I started my research. Questions that I ask is like, why wasn't this bus line in this neighborhood prior? Did working class people not need to use public transportation? My findings on the environmental side speak back and question the veracity of the assertion that gardening and greening is being employed to reduce the urban heat island effect. Gardening and greening, while valuable, is not enough of an intervention to actually reduce urban heat, light, heat islands and further serves to increase the value of land. For instance, for greening, greening to meaningfully combat urban heat islands, like first there needs to be a, a lot of it. Um, there's some great research on this. Uh, and there would also need to be a significant policy addressing emission reduction from vehicles and other you know, industries in Montreal, like the oil refinery on the east end of the island. And I argue that other social policies are also needed to prevent green gentrification from contributing to evictions and human displacement that leads to housing precarity and food insecurity, which of course gardens in Montreal are claiming to address. Without direct access to private land, gardening for any purpose is always under threat. Many of the photos that I showed you of gardens are gone now. Even one on that university campus. It's now a new school. It's a new collaboration with Trafalgar. Yeah, interestingly, a community-based initiative with whom I've partnered and, and I'm just starting up a new partnership with called Greening Chinatown. They were evicted about four times from different garden locations by the city of Montreal. And surprisingly, their garden is no longer located in Chinatown. It's almost seven kilometers north. Or I think they're moving back to Chinatown now, but for the last decade, they've been, they've been out of Chinatown. They were in Masson, in Rosemont. And this mirrors larger patterns of dispossession that continues to occur in Montreal and other large cities. All over North America, at the height of urban renewal, when new highways and developments were constructed through underserved and low-income neighborhoods to move people from the suburbs into city centers for work, displacing thousands of people, the primary measurement for de determining the path of a highway or the location of a new development was not crime rates, access to education, access to green spaces, or the needs and health, the, the needs, health, and well-being of those communities, but rather it was where the city could turn more profit. Following this logic, Montreal, Quebec, and Canadian governments worked in concert to build major in infrastructure projects like the Turcotte, Bonaventure, Ville Marie Expressways through neighborhoods like Saint Henri, Little Burgundy, Point Saint Charles, Griffin Town, and Chinatown, destroying and expropriating majority working class as well as uh, the neighborhoods of Chinese people who call Montreal home and the Black Anglophone communities of Little Burgundy, the West End. In the city of Montreal, reports from the time of these expropriations labeled these communities as urban slums. There was no mention of race, which Stephen High notes as a form of racism in itself. In municipal documents and media representations of the time, the communities of Little Burgundy and Chinatown were textually positioned as part of the Anglophone minority, which further permitted the erasure of Black and Chinese presence in Montreal, while over-highlighting the marginalization of the French-speaking working class during Quebec's Quiet Revolution. That's Stephen High again. Understanding our history is integral for working in community gardens here in Montreal, where old and tired linguistic tensions between Canada's colonial language groups continues to silence the pervasive systemic racism in the city, province, and country. So while I'm building and installing gardens with our community partners for social, environmental, and educational purposes, municipal governments are using similar gardens in gentrifying neighborhoods of Montreal. In gentrified neighborhoods like Place Saint-Henri, Chinatown, community gardens and urban agriculture initiatives that once served to support local citizens in some way through food production, education, recreation, or to where gardens in the past have attempted to take land out of the market economy and de decommodify it, might now function as symbols of authentic urban communities more apt to structure the consumption preferences of the new urban middle class, such as you know, local organic foods, rather than offer refuge for people who can no longer afford to live in a neighborhood. Taken together, I contend that in this historical moment of climate emergency, people living, learning, working, and gardening in the city need to see how these environmental sustainability efforts 
pedagogies and policies produce differential and inequitable effects at the level of a large and diverse urban population. There are no easy solutions to community learning in relation to urban gardening for any purpose. Gardens on their own or greening on its own is not enough of an intervention to solve issues as complex as access to education, in barriers to employment, urban heat islands, food insecurity, decreasing pollination and, you know, increasing biodiversity and so on. I resist the idea that installing a garden is enough to make a positive impact on its own. I also know firsthand that educators, community workers often need and want a garden, but they are more in need of financial support, pedagogical support, less bureaucracy, human resource support, more time, fewer students, curricular freedom, relevant professional development, and ultimately, better housing, employment, educational, and environmental policies. And community change, importantly, takes time and ongoing collective effort. Climate change is not something that society succeeds or fails at. It's not binary. Everything we do to raise awareness makes a difference. To conclude today, I wanna to state that every educational moment or encounter doesn't need to be revolutionary in the same way that gardens for social, environmental, and educational purposes do not need to be these supernatural sites that can solve all social, environmental, and educational issues. As HIV AIDS activist Sarah Schulman points out, before hippies, feminism, civil rights, and the anti-war movements of the late 1960s started to generate momentum, there had been decades of foundational work laid by writers, thinkers, filmmakers, poets, performers, artists, and many others who helped people imagine a different future in a better world. In this current moment of climate crisis, where it's no longer just existential, I contend that we are inhabiting a different foundational period on the precipice of something different. And it's time to start planting those seeds. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Is. Wow. So that's what you do. <laughs> that was a that, of that's what, one project, one project. <laughs> that's one project. Questions, comments? Maybe there's some in the chat for Mitch. We do actually have one in the chat that we can start off with. This is from Jennifer. Uh, do you connect with the peace gardens that were developed decades ago throughout Canada? No, not yet. I'd love to hear more about it, though. Wonderful. Are there any other questions in the space? Oh, Jochen, nice. <laughs> Thanks a lot. That was mind blowing. Oh, I don't know about that. That's Thank great. you, Johan. Yeah. Um, so I just have a tiny little question. When you talked about your methods, so you, yeah. what type of data do you collect or are you interested in? I know you're interested yep. in scholarly work of people who have written something interesting, relevant, and yeah. you take photos. What else do you do? Yeah. So my, my research is qualitative in nature. I, I my, my main methods are observations, participant observations, and interviews. So I do institutional ethnography. It starts off like any other ethnography. But after I conduct the early part of my research, which is you know field work, observations, understanding cultures, I then, instead of analyzing my data and seeking to make sense of it with a theory or a concept, I resist doing that. And then I, I start what's called the textual analysis, where I look to policy and text that help explicate why I'm getting those types of answers from my participants. Oh, we have a follow-up. Uh, if you don't mind, I yeah. find this fascinating because it seems to be non-reductionist. It, it is, that's it what is I love absolutely, about. yeah. Yes, so you, you find a way to, whatever the alternative is, what would you say? Is it holistic or what is it? Yeah, I, mean, I don't know if it's holistic. I mean, I think institutional ethnography is amazing. I really do. I'm an institutional ethnographer. I don't think it's without fault. Um, I also kind of resist the idea that it's this radical re-envisioning of sociology. It probably was when Dorothy Smith started it in like 1987, worked with a, a group of people um, who, who continue to kind of develop those methods. It's an evolving method of inquiry. It's, not, it's even not, uh, it's called more of a, an epistemology uh, or a sociology. Um, so it's, it's like a way of doing research. Um, yeah, it's definitely non-reductionist. It's also incredibly time consuming. Like I don't recommend that masters or, or sometimes even PhD students who want to get out of, you know, 
the, a doctoral program within four to five years take on this method of inquiry. It's unbelievably labor intensive, but I do think that it um, in, instead of like trying to make sense of your participants' accounts, what you do is you kind of point to institutions that shape diverging human experience. Wonderful. Do we have any other questions in the space? Yes, I see one right here. Well, my question is a bit um, different because I was asking myself, like, you have different uh, gardens, but do you also um, do you also do new project, um, more like technology for those gardens, or is it only like hands on garden? Yeah, it's mostly mostly pretty hands on. Yes, yeah. and uh, in like twenty twenty four, would not be interested in, in like spreading more of awareness for those uh, gardens. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, I'm always if if different community based organizations are are down with me raising awareness about the projects, then absolutely. In like a different way. Do you, have, do you have recommendations about how I can do a, a better job at raising awareness? Uh, not a better job, but uh, maybe like add on, because I think it's always good to like keep an uh, open mind to uh, see maybe like what could be, um, because we change, people change, uh, a different uh, generation mm -hmm. also is going to change. Um, so I believe that uh, maybe today you're doing great. Maybe there's something that... Uh, we are also um we could add on to maybe boost it even more because i think yeah. like uh, the 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 new generation are more attracted to different things than gardening and like to bring them back it have to be something that um kind of like connect with the way they are already thinking mm. and using like technology cool like what type of technology um, well, I will have to put a brevet first. <laughs> okay, 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 nice. <laughs> but yeah, well, unless you want me to sing. Uh... Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. That'd be great. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? I see one in the front row here. Yeah, Jen, thanks. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering, how do you approach community gardening or, or establishing gardening in community spaces versus in academic institutions? <laughs> If you have the time. <laughs> yeah. Um, pretty similar. Uh, pretty similar. Sometimes it's a bit easier to um, access a garden in and with a community-based organization. But so many community-based organizations with whom I've partnered over the last decade at one point had private land and no longer have private land. So we're, you know, I'm asking the city of Montreal to either give us a garden plot or to open up a parking lot that, that they own for gardening purposes and um yeah so in in really similar ways and if i can if i can like offer a simplified response just finding creative ways to subvert bureaucracy to actually do good work it's hard yeah we have another question online this one's from cindy uh thank you to the speaker first and foremost you spoke about three sisters garden would you explain what that is yeah, it's a Haudenosaunee garden that is um, corn, bean, and squash, representing the three sisters. Great. Do, you to, do you want to explicate a bit more? Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's way more than that. Go on. No, I, 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 I'll, I'll let someone else answer that. Yeah, yeah. Other questions, comments? Hi, uh, I just have a comment about the land and gardens as well. You were talking about how sometimes there's not access mm. to certain spaces. Uh, just a comment from my experience when I was working at an elementary school mm. last year, they were doing actually composting initiatives and they were doing a garden in the little space they had outside of their classroom. And it was super nice because the teacher had included a lot of his pedagogy connected to this garden so they composted they they planted new plants and a lot of behaviors even had completely turned around kids were super motivated to come in so just having that little space really changed a lot of the education and when you had mentioned how there's not a lot of access to land even the littlest things could be super impactful without us really you know 
knowing. So yeah, just a little comment about my experience in couldn't with agree young more. Kids. Yeah. Thanks so much for sharing. No problem. Yeah. Uh, I see one right here. Yeah. Hi. Um, I was curious because you talked quite a bit about uh, just the impacts of settler colonialism and gentrification on how gardens end up being employed. Uh, if any of your research sort of looked in to how um, sort of the changing understanding of like the commons being mm -hmm. space that is held for the community versus private space that the government monitors mm -hmm. has impacted some of that um, access to gardening space or even like how we perceive what the setup of a garden is often as you said, having a, a gate and a locked door or sort of only being allowed to access by the people who've agreed to show up and garden rather than being um, the sort of more uh, communal space outside of who might know and show up to the garden each week. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I could share a, a range of stories that I've heard of, of, of people who have attempted to enter a community garden which is supposed to be public land um and you know had had the cops called on them because when someone who presents as homeless or who's who might be experiencing homelessness enters one of these spaces they're not a registered garden gardener of a, a Montreal community garden and uh, you know the cops are called or something like that so yeah um, in relation to settler colonialism or like just like the surveillance of public spaces, like David Harvey writes about how uh, some of these more public spaces are actually the most monitored. Um, yeah, and I certainly see gentrification and, and this isn't me, like many people have written about this. Uh, Glenn Coulthard writes beautifully about this, about how how like gentrification is uh, Alicia Elliott as well, uh, if you're familiar with with uh, with their work. Um, Right says like gentrification as being this ongoing process of capital accumulation of of land dispossession and accumulation. So, yeah, I think it I think it mirrors the same logic as some of the land grabs that happened at the outset of capitalism. Question at the back. Back here. Hi, great. Thanks for <clears throat> thanks for that really uh, insightful and. Uh, Powerful talk. Um, the uh, yeah, I keep hearing about like that. Well, I've heard that there that some of those the uh, management of the community gardens in Montreal have some kind of like little mafias going on, and there's also sort of a racket, and it's kind of like it sounds quite sketchy. But I do, there are I think there are maybe examples of like collective gardens where by and, and I get from your talk too that um, like that there's this greenwashing and it's being incorporated into. Uh, policies and 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 programs yeah. in order to kind of like uh yeah for to kind of do somewhat somewhat sketchy reasons um but i also hear that you're kind of suggesting or saying that they'd also have great educational value and maybe it's kind of what i get from your talk is that maybe that's yeah. maybe more importantly where that has a lot of uh emphasis so in montreal i mean i'm definitely very aware of at UCAM, the crapo and their yep. gardening and all the work that they've done over the years. And I kind of feel like that's, and it's still going yeah. at this. So there are, there are these examples of these gardens that, uh, that do transform the people who get involved with them. So are, are you, where do you see, and I know that you subverting bureaucracies and kind of heart, it's like, there's a lot of, a lot of red tape, but where are you seeing uh, like um, gardens being used re recently in a really important and meaningful way that's like mobilizing participation and getting, getting, I don't getting the youth who are more interested in technology to get involved, like, and sure. into like, where do you see anything you've seen happening? I, I think there are so many amazing gardening programs and initiatives here in Montreal. It's not about, it's not about like, um, so I just, the, the, the example you referenced from UCAM, that's the rooftop garden on the Palais de Congrès. Okay, got it. Cool. All, all the gardens that were there and like the, the collective that started that up, I guess in the 2010s, early 2010s, late 2000s. Yeah. But they're involved, I think, with the um, stuff at Palais de well, maybe, but uh, but just like the student initiatives of, of gardening. Yeah. I think it's still there. Yeah, no, I think I think gardens can absolutely provide so much transformation, transformational 
education, et cetera. I, I'm, I'm not, I would never contest that. Um, what I think is like, we need to kind of complicate all of the over celebratory discourse around gardens. And if we're gonna say gardens can do this for food security or this for the environment or this for education, then I think we need to also complicate that with what it actually looks like when a human being does this. Now, there was that awesome example that was offered about, about um, a composting and using the compost in the garden. That's amazing. But I, when I'm working with educators in different schools, they describe, you know, adding any type of garden based experience as creating a ton of administrative labor. Right. I didn't show any photos of school gardens kind kind of intentionally. Um, you may have noticed that there's no photos of people in this. And now in visual research, we take this no faces approach. Right. Thinking about that. Is it ethical question? Uh, you should have you know consent before you take a photo of someone. Um, but the only photos I've ever displayed that had people in them were when I was working with young people in the garden. And there's my face and there are young people's faces. And what I found really interesting about those photos, they were posted on Twitter and that's why I used them, was that it was easier for the school to post those photos on Twitter of me and young people working in gardens than it was to actually get permissions for them to go outside. That took six months. So like there are a lot of administrative permissions to go through to even get young people hooked up to an outdoor learning experience. So what does that look like? So when I say like subverting bureaucracy, like how do we make garden plans so accessible that it's not a year of planning? Why isn't there funding opportunities just given to educators, given that we're in a climate crisis and we need to learn all these super important skills that uh, are relevant? Why is it that so few students have access to these types of quality outdoor and environmental experiences? You know, so it's like like asking more critical questions about this. So when I think about settler colonialism in relation to gardens, well, we can talk about the history and politics of land and water use for a long time. So like, why don't, why, you know, and it's like, we, 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 I'm not, I'm generalizing. I'm talking about myself as an educator who's actually, you know, responsible for creating toolkits for teachers here in Quebec. Like, that's like my next project. Um, and a lot of it is like preparing these ready-made documents so that, Teachers know exactly what they need to do to get students hooked up to a garden-based learning experience. Yeah, like just like making things a little bit more efficient so that it's not like, okay, now you have to apply a year in advance with the Mesure program to get a thousand bucks, which can go a long way if you know how to spend garden money and you start your own seedlings. But gardens are expensive. They're really expensive. You know, all the gardens, like I, I, over 10 years, I, I've received a lot of grant funding and it's all gone. Paying people equi equitably, think about like, you know, asking people to volunteer their time or to think about someone gardening for, for their own food insecurity when they're food insecure and they're looking uh, for emergency shelter in one place of the city and then trying to get to their employment somewhere else in the city. And then you're going to ask them to garden for four or five hours. Come on. It's just like asking more critical questions and understanding the complexity of some of these over celebratory statements. Yeah, it's not that straightforward. And that's like kind of what I wanted to conclude with is that there are no simple answers, right? And we've been exploited as a, as a population for easy answers. Oh, we're in a climate crisis. We're just going to plant 2 billion trees. Everything's going to be fine. Don't worry about it. Not quite. It's a little bit more than that. Yeah. Any other last questions? Well, maybe we'll call it there because we have a nice example of collective action going on out here and Mitch would approve. I got to join them. <laughs> Mitch is going, uh -huh. so... Uh, so, Mitch, thanks very much. Thank you. What an incredible talk. So, oh, well. thank you very much. Thanks so much. Rebecca has a few words. Thanks so much, Mitchell. I have, like, don't run away right away. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone, for coming. It's fantastic to see you all on Zoom as well and in person. Um, I hope that you will come back. We are uh, done with our programming for the week at Four Space, but we will be on Friday at Loyola where the gardens are waking up. So come see the gardens uh -huh. at Loyola. Uh, we have a fantastic um, bunch of uh, researchers who will be presenting their work and discussing um, various issues in sustainability and around the theme of hope and agency uh, on Friday at Loyola. We will only be in person. So if you're on Zoom, please come to Loyola on Friday. Um, it's where the party is um, and where the gardens are and the trees Pretty your campus and we'll provide food so you won't starve. <laughs> um, uh, so 
please do check out the schedule. If you got here today, then you know where to find it. Uh, but uh, it's it's all there online. The recordings from everything that we have done here at Force Space are also already on the Force Space channel uh, and on the conference web page. So where you registered, you can go back and, and you know, if you miss something or you want to catch up with something, um, do check it out. Mitchell, you're not up yet, but you will be. You are on the Force Space channel. I just haven't gotten you on the conference website yet, but you'll be there by tonight. Um, can we move quickly just to the next one? Thank you. Okay, so this, uh, as I said, does conclude our part of the conference at Force Space. So I have to um, doubly, triply, quadruply thank the fantastic people at Force Space um, for providing us with this space and with their amazing professional expertise, technical help, um, patience, kindness. <laughs> So to, to Doug and Issa and Jax and Bertie, um, really, uh, really fantastic to work with you as always. Um, this is a conference that we uh, we host a, a sustainability across disciplines conference every year at the Loyola College for Diversity and Sustainability and the Loyola Sustainability Research Center. Um, we often partner with Force Space and we always do a day at Loyola as well. Um, we have funding for this uh, for this conference from the Office of Research under the Sustainability Action Plan. There is funding for sharing research across disciplines in sustainability. So thank you to the Office of Research. Um, we also have uh, partnered um, with, uh, with units across the university. So the Science College and the School of Community and Public Affairs and First People Studies and the Departments of Biology, Geography, Planning and Environment, Political Science and Communication Studies continue to be fantastic partners. We appreciate every year um, working with you. So thank you to all of our sponsors. And with that, we invite you to come on Friday in person. Love to see you. Um, and, and again, thank you to Force Space and thank you all for coming. We do have protests out here over current proposed tuition hikes, which not to be political will severely negatively affect the economy of this city and the diversity of our student body, which breaks my personal heart um, in their singing. So uh, we'll wrap up for today. Um, there's still some sun, so get out and enjoy and uh, use your voices. Thank you, Mitchell, one last time. Thank you to the four spaces. Okay, everyone, that's it for us. Thank you to everyone, of course. I'm going to add on more thank yous. I'll tell them individually. We're so great to have everyone here for this. We're going to be closing up the Zoom, closing up our live stream. But remember, all 12 episodes of this series are online on our YouTube channel, and we're making a playlist for that. Be sure to revisit all that. Uh, 